thing that the one, the one thing that I would that really ministered to me over the, the, the week at Andrews was um, Andrew spoke about the the need to talked about what hope was and um, I imagine other people are going to talk about that but briefly hope is the use of your mind in in, in using it in a, a to build a positive imagination. Um, and the same word is used, um, used mind. No, I'm not going to go there because that's not what my notes are about. The last night he talked then about after building us up for the whole week, building your hope and using your imagination in a positive way to see yourself the way God sees you, and, um, and that you use hope, and that how often we are praying, we're trying to use our faith to grab hold of something that we haven't yet established it in hope. We haven't got a clear image of what that is supposed to look like in us, and that was a message really um, pertinent to myself, to to be able to see me the way um, God would have me to go. And I had a pretty clear idea for most of my life. I wanted to be a wife and a mother, raise kids, raise godly children. Um, that was pretty clear. I had an idea. But for the last couple years, it's just kind of been floundering. What about what, what now for me? What does the future look like? For me, do I have a future? Am I, do I need to just hang it up and say, well, that was fun and be set out to pasture? Wasn't thinking that was, um, I was hoping that wasn't God's plan for the time I had left. And so, so this message about uh, developing in your, developing time, spending time, building an image that is positive and then and then seeing that. And then, then he, the, the final night that he spoke, he, he talked about lifting up your eyes. And, um, and the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, are written for four different purposes, four different people, um, from four different perspectives. And if you want to know what those perspectives are, I'm a, I'm a writer. And, and I, always, I always start writing something with the end in mind. This is what it's going to end with. And I don't really know how I'm going to get there, um, but it's always kind of a fun journey. Well, I, I, so if you want to know what a writer is writing about and what they really want you to get, start at the end and um, find out what that's all about. Matthew, he wrote for the purpose of... Um, people who wanted to be developed into disciples. He, the purpose of the, the Gospel of Matthew is to build disciples. So all of the stories that he used, he, he formulated them, or he put them together in a way to train people to be disciples. Mark, he wanted you to know about the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost working in the earth right now, and his book is about signs and wonders and the power of God to affect signs and wonders in your life. So when you read Mark, know that that's what he wants. He wants to stir up in you a desire to see signs and wonders working in your life. Luke, he wrote for, um, for the purpose of you being able to have the scriptures um, made clear in your mind um, so that you would understand, how, uh, understand, and understand scriptures. And John, he wrote for... Um, the people who needed to be restored and who have maybe um, experienced failure and um, things didn't work out so well. And when they came to the end of themselves, they didn't maybe like what they saw. They hoped that maybe they would have um, operated differently. Maybe they would have made different choices. It's Peter denying Christ three times and the restoration of that relationship. John wrote for 
us, um, for me. You think, you, you hope that you will come, you, when you get presented with an opportunity to stand or run, I would hope I had the strength to stand or the wherewithal or the image in myself, the, the imagination developed in such a way that I would have seen myself, you know, standing or not denying Christ or whatever. But for, for the, anybody that's experienced failure or being an outcast or an outsider or somebody who feels left out or they don't really belong, John is for you. So, so there's, there's a story that um, is in both Matthew and in John. And it's the story about feeding 5,000. And um, here were all of these people, and they came to the Lord, and they listened to him, and, and it was getting late, and they were too far away to get any, have any food, and he didn't want them heading back and um, fainting along the way. And he looked at Philip, and he said, what are we, we going to do to feed these folks? He says, well, we could pool all of our money, and we wouldn't have enough. And you know, you know the story. Um, and, and in Matthew, it says that the Lord lifted up his eyes. And we kind of, I don't know, tend to look at that as going, and that isn't it at all. It's, you, you lift up your eyes to look beyond what you're seeing here in the natural world. Naturally, it was impossible Naturally, they didn't, all they had were five loaves and two fish, and that's all they had to feed well over 5,000 people. And, um, and the whole concept of lifting up your eyes is looking up beyond what is natural and seeing it from God's perspective. And, um, and so I love the story in Matthew. But I really like John, because John puts that story in a different context from a different perspective. And, um, and, and when he tells the story, he puts it in a way that we, we find out that this happened at a time that um, the Lord had... Uh, he had performed a miracle on the Sabbath, and now all the religious people wanted to kill him. And that you'll find that in John, like about the fifth chapter. And, and he is, in response to these people wanting to kill him, he's saying, I only do what I see my father do. I can only do what I've seen him show me to do. And... And then it's in, the, it's in the middle of that thing. He's, then John gives us this story where here in the middle of all this, the Lord has learned. He says, what you, have, you see yourself the way God sees you. You just lift up your eyes. You see God doing things through you and in you to affect the world in the natural realm. But you first lift up your eyes and you see it in the heavenly realm. And then you just walk it out and do it. And... Um, so in the middle of, of Jesus, uh, the biggest trial um, when he was facing in the natural realm where they wanted to kill him, he lifted up his eyes and saw himself doing exactly what the Father would have him do. And, um, and even when it might look really, really crazy to everybody else and you don't understand, just lift up your eyes. Before you take a step, get God's imagination, get his picture solid in your heart, and then do it. And um, so that was so um, powerful for me to um, uh, spend time now to develop an image of what is the next this next phase of my life. What is that going to look like? And um, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> I'll come hold it so we don't drop it. 
You know, before I left, I preached a little bit on just, uh, um, what did I preach on? Be alert. You know, and some of these things, they sound so awesome and everything else, but you think, well, how do I really incorporate that? Listen, it's, a, it's a more simple than you think. Just stop and be aware and be alert that there is, that God will show you something. And when it says lift up your eyes, it's, it's receive sight. That God will show you what, what the next step is. You're going to go, well, what if he doesn't do it? Well, just keep practicing. But a lot of people are just like, just stop and just say, God, what do you got for me? And you know, I'll tell you, God will, God will show you. Give him some time. Tammy. First, I'd like to say thank you for all of those that gave so that I could go. I can't tell you, it's been a long time since I've done something like this. I didn't even, I, did, I told John, I said, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to deal with this. It's like, I was numb, didn't have any feelings. I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm so emotional. I go up and I go down and I had absolutely nothing <laughs> most of the time that I was there and I had to just kind of stir myself up because I'm like, gosh, you know, I, I don't know. It was, it's, it's a weird feeling for me not to have any feelings. So I didn't really know what was going on. I, you know, Rich always referred to himself as a redheaded stepchild. That's what I felt like was a redheaded stepchild. I was on the outside looking in at all these people, trying to figure out what the rules were and not knowing what they were and, and didn't know how to play the game. But I just, I, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful that you gave. I'm so thankful that the money was there, that I could go, uh, that I didn't have any expenses to cover. That was a huge, huge blessing in my life. And so. And I was thankful for the opportunity to try to figure out how to set my time aside and, and just listen. I, like I said, I haven't had that for a while. But I, as I was contemplating this morning about what to share, there was some time ago, it was years and years and years ago, I remember I was uh, getting ready for Wednesday night or what have you, and, and I had a vision, imagination, whatever you want to call it, but it was like I felt like the, the, the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the area between Rapid City and Sturgis, and it was like this dark cloud, and he was and he was just hovering there, and it was similar to like you know what he did uh, at the beginning of time. You know, it said the spirit of the Lord hovered over the earth. You know, he was just hovering, he was just waiting to do something. He was waiting for the Lord to speak, and and so that he could act upon what God was going to speak, and he was going to bring it into being. Well, at that time, when I had this vision, I remember just seeing the Spirit of the Lord just moving, you know, and he was moving. And one of the things that was ministered at the conference was that if your relationship with the Lord is not showing signs and wonders, uh, if you're not seeing the supernatural take place within your life, then it's like, it, it, I, I can't really explain it, but it's like, you know, it, it, it should be signs and wonders should follow those whom they should, be, you know, whom and those who believe. So initially when I heard that, I was like, man, you know, I... I, I'm not, I'm not seeing that, I'm not, I'm not, you know, and I, I received it as condemnation, like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not seeing these things, and so therefore, you know, maybe I'm not believing, and therefore I got to get something again, and I hate that feeling when I walk away from a speaker and think, I got to get something, I got to, <laughs> I got to do something, I got to be something more than I am, I hate that feeling, and so I resist it with everything I have, because gosh, I don't feel that it's God, I don't feel that it's love, I don't think it's the Spirit of God, so it brought me back to this place where the Spirit of God was hovering, and, 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 you know, and ever since that time, and that was years ago, years ago that I remember feeling that and seeing it and that the Spirit of God, I have seen the Lord work. I have seen the Lord do things. I have seen miracles. And sometimes we forget. And, you know, in the United States, we think that if a miracle doesn't happen, like the, I dream, uh, the dream of genie kind of thing, you know, where you just blink your eyes and boom, there it is. You know, you just boom, there it is. Say the magical incantation and boom, there it is. You know, we think that that's the way that a miracle is supposed to take place. We think that that's the way the supernatural takes place. But you know, that's so contrary to the way that God works because everything God does, he's a process. It's a seed. It goes in the ground. It gets watered. It gets fertilized. It gets nurtured. And then it comes up and it begins to produce. It produces fruit. And I, and I thought back, and you know, he brought me back to the remembrance of that time when I remember seeing the Spirit of God move, just waiting. And, and I can look back and I can see the miracles. I can see the times when my body has been healed. I can see the times when he has provided for me. 
I can see when a life was heading this way and the Spirit of God moved upon him and they turned and then they went this way and they drew towards him and I thought, God, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking that you're not doing the supernatural in my life. Forgive me for not remembering the times that you have produced the supernatural in my life. You know, and even here, I thought, gosh, we're just a small group of believers. We're such a small group. Really, what difference can we make? What difference can we make? And then again, the Spirit of God brought me back to that place of like, look at the difference you have made. Look at what you have done. Look at the nations that you've imparted to. Look at the disciples that have been trained and come alongside and have received your teaching. Look at what has done. And then he said again, he says, and I always work with a minority. I always work with that which the world thinks has nothing to offer. He says, I always take the small and, and, and the somewhat abased things. And he says, and I empower them with the Holy Spirit. And I cause them to do greater and mightier things than that they ever could before. And so I was reminded, reminded of the Spirit of God that was moving on the earth again today. And he's moving in my life. And as, as Andrew did minister, you know, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and he turned towards him, and I, the Spirit of God is looking for the, for the one who will lift up and turn and turn. Repent from the way that they think it needs to be. Repent from the way that they think it should happen. Repent from the way that it has happened. Repent and then turn, turn towards him and, and acknowledge the Spirit of God in our lives, in this body of believers, and then let that impartation take place and let that word come forth so the Spirit of God can combine, as Rick said this morning, as, 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 to speak as, so the Spirit of the Lord can combine his power with your word and bring into manifestation the kingdom of God as he would have it be. I hope that made sense to you. I was having a hard time bringing it together. But again, I'm so thankful for you. We are at the right place at the right time. We are the right group of people to do what God has called us to do. We have seen a lot, but the best is yet to come because God is always on the increase. He's always on the offense. He's never on the defense. He's never afraid and looking to see where the attack is going to come from. He's always going in and plowing out the darkness because that is his character, that is his nature, and we are created in his likeness and his image. We are just like him, just like him. So thank you, bless you, and I'm just so thankful. Again, I am, I'm so thankful for all of you, for your relationships, for your love, for your support, for your prayers. Can't even express what I feel in my heart, amen. Okay. We did have a great time. I mean, you know, uh, for a lot of years, it's just least I just slipped down there. But uh, um, I, I, I feel a little bit strange because I was, me and David were only men in the whole group. <laughs> and we'd go to a restaurant, and nine of us, you know. And uh, But, man, I tell you, uh, we just had a great time just being together. And, uh, again, all of us are extremely thankful. Some of you gave to that specifically or whatever else. But just, to, you know, as a staff here, we like you said, we sometimes don't get all that much time just to fellowship together or be together relaxing. We're always just, you know, working. But and Rachel, she's just really uh, touching my heart. She's growing in grace and the knowledge of God and confidence. And uh, this gal is just blooming before her eyes. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, I just like being with them. Well, on Thursday, I opened up my book and I started writing down this thing that I thought God told me that, that I need to share on. So I started writing it, and I messed up twice. Turn the page, write it again. Woke up this morning. All right, God, what do you want me to do? This isn't working. I read it through it, so I'm not even going to read what I wrote. And I told Pastor John that I wrote something down on Thursday. I'm prepared this time, not like last time. But there was something that Andrew Womack said. I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to tell you a story. It says, Jesus did not say, pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. I was like, whoa. And then Andrew goes on and says this story about this woman who wants to see someone raised from the dead. 
that would be really cool, seeing someone getting raised from the dead. Well, this woman goes to a gas station. She's filling up her car. This was like three, I'm not even going to say what, how long it took. She's filling up her car, and there's this old man, and this guy sitting next to him at a bus, bus stop waiting for the bus. And this man is smoking a cigarette, and the old man's just sitting there. And he starts coughing stands up and he falls down. He's having a heart attack. She's like, wow, I'm going to see this man getting raised from the dead. And by this time, there's a group around these, this guy laying on the ground and this man still smoking a cigarette, like whatever. <laughs> and so this woman like goes over there and there's a crowd around her and she goes down next to him and says, in the name of Jesus, go fly, go fly. It's like, um, no, it didn't work. So she does it. She Goes to his ear. Don't come alive. Come alive. This is, this is kind of embarrassing. Don't <laughs> well, then Jesus like spoke to her. He's like, no. And I don't remember who. Lazarus. God spoke to Lazarus and said, command whatever it is to come alive. So she stands up and says, in the name of Jesus, you will come to life. And the man stands up and the guy in the suit. <laughs> cigarette falls out of his mouth. He's like, holy cow, I just watched this man get raised from the dead. And this woman that wanted to see this man get raised from the dead actually got to see this man get raised from the dead. I just thought that was so cool. It's just, you can't be secret. You can't whisper what you want. <laughs> you got to say what you want and believe it'll happen. Awesome. <laughs> did good. You did good, hon. Oh, you did good. Oh, pardon me. I had that feeling. I just couldn't get it in my head. <laughs> well, did you know at 845 when I walked in here, the Spirit of God came in here as well? Yeah. When I walked into this building, the Spirit of God was here because he's inside of me and he never leaves me. So the Spirit of God is here in every single one of you. Just wanted to clarify that really quick. Oh, Rachel, at the end of that story, I don't know if she was listening, but the really cool part... <laughs> I had to finish this. It's amazing. The guy sits up and he goes, my wife told me that I was going to go to hell. I was in hell. And he like thanks this lady and he goes, pray with me. Yeah, he goes, pray with me. I, I, I heard your voice and I came back. Will you pray with me? So the guy got saved right there because his wife had told him, you don't change your ways. You're going to hell. And so he was, and then the guy with the cigarette was like, <laughs> so I thought that was really cool that you know he had he was on his way to hell or in hell or something but I thought that was kind of amazing yeah he's but in hell and he didn't hear till she shouted and then he he heard the shout that's pretty cool so uh well like what my mom said hope is the anticipation of good positive imagination versus negative imagination and um, in Romans 8, 24 and 25, it says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For a man, for what a man seeth, why doeth he hope for? Why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? What it's saying there is, if we haven't seen it in our imagination, if I haven't seen myself playing my piano and praising God and you guys praising God, I don't have patience. If I have not visioned that, I don't have patience to wait for it. But if I have visioned it, and if I have seen it, I then have the patience to see it out on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, the imagination is our spiritual womb. It's where everything is created. When I was pregnant with Kian and, and my little girl Wyatt, <laughs> Marty knows that joke, um, they were being formed. They were being created. They were, they were going from itty bitty to 19 inches. You know, that's where they were created. In our mind, we have to see things because that's where it's created. It's our spiritual womb. If I haven't envisioned it, if I haven't taken the time to dream about something, then it's not going to come to pass because I can't see it. I won't believe it if I don't see it first with my spiritual eyes, with my heart. Um, paint pictures for your audience so that they remember the story. Andrew said that one day, and I thought that was amazing because that's me. I have the hardest time. I was just telling my mom, like, this week sometime, I can't remember if it was before or after. I have the hardest time reading, like, 
self-help books or, you know, like I just have the hardest time because I can't get a picture in my mind of things. Now give me like a Karen Kingsbury book where I can think, get the family, I got the picture of the farm, the house, I can go on and on and on and on. But those self-help books take me ages to read. I'm not even joking. I think I started one five years ago, and I'm still reading it. <laughs> like, it just, I don't have the picture of what needs, to be, what needs to happen. So maybe I need to ask somebody, what's the picture? Can you give me your pictures? And I have a picture, and I can, I can go from there. Um, um, but he told this story about, you know, seeing with our, with our heart, with our spiritual eyes. And this lady, he told us, um, there's this pastor's wife who was blind as a bat. He said she had Coke bottle glasses. They were just thick, and she couldn't see, and she'd been prayed for over and over and over again. And she was just discouraged. Like, she's, she was done. I don't, I don't want this anymore, God. Like, I am, this is, it's just disappointing. Well, they had this healing minister come to their church, and she purposefully hung back. Like, tried to avoid him at all costs. Well, he cornered her, and he said, I want to pray for you. She's like, okay, because she's not going to tell him no. Like, he's already got her in the corner. And so he prays for her. And he gets done praying, and he goes, now can you see? And she opens her eyes, and she goes, no. And he goes, close your eyes. And he prayed for her again, and he goes, now can you see? She opens her eyes, and she goes, no. And he goes, close your eyes. And he prays for her again. And then when he goes, can you see? And she goes to open her eyes, and he says, No. Can you see? I didn't tell you to open your eyes. And then she got it, and she started praying in tongues. And she saw herself living without the glasses. She saw herself seeing things with her natural eyes. And then she opened her eyes, and she was able to see. It's very important for us to see with our heart things that will come to pass. Things that we, our, our brain and our mind can't fathom, like we can't. You can't think up dreams and visions so incredibly amazing with our mind. Like, that's just, eh. Put it with our heart, with the power of God. The un- unthinkable, the, the unthinkable can happen with the power of God that's in our heart. Use your imagination. Hope for that which is seen not, because once it is seen, it's no longer hope. That's what that verse is saying in 25. But if we hope for that, we see not, then, oh, no, that's the wrong one. The one before that. For if we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. So the second we've seen something come to pass, it's not hope. Quid and I had a rough time when we lived on Mead Avenue, and I'm a budgeter. I got my columns. I got my budgets. I got, you know, tithe and offering and all. I've got it all down. (laughs) And every time I would get to the end of my columns where we're got food and gas, and I would just cry because I was like, God, it's gone. I have nothing. I have nothing left. I can't do this. I can't pay for this. And I would just get Cody and I'd say, we have to pray. And I would hope, and Cody and I would pray about our bills being paid. Thank you, God, that we will have food in the house. And I had high schoolers coming over on Wednesday nights in this little itty-bitty house, you know, and I was, I was feeding them, and I would make sure that I always had something for them. But yet my, my budget in the paper, and numbers are right. <laughs> so I use a pencil. Because <laughs> if there's a penny gone, you have to find it. Yes, yes. So I would sit there, and I would hope, Cody and I would pray, and we would hope for it to meet. Thank you, God, that this is taken care of. That it's, I was, I don't even know if I was working. I was working here. I don't know if I was getting paid. <laughs> but I know Cody was working in Rapid, and oh my gosh, gas was like everything. I think we paid more in gas than our little apartment. <laughs> and I was always like, oh God. And I would hope I had patience get those other columns paid for. I would shut that every month we lived in that house and say, okay, God, this is not, this is not making me feel good. <laughs> it's not lining up. I need it to line up because it makes, it, it's okay that way. Then it's okay. But David Hinton was saying, you know, he's got leg issues and stuff. 
he was at the hospital. And the doctors were saying to him, you know, you've got a tumor in your leg. We've got to cut it off. And he was at the point where he's like, okay, let's do it. Like, I've got things to do. I need to go somewhere. And he was, he told the doctors, let's go. But the doctors left his room. And the Holy Spirit says, you didn't talk to me about this. I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you you were going to lose your leg. Why did you tell the doctors? Well, apparently this doctor has been around him a while because the doctor walks in and Dave goes, well, you know you're going to tell me the medical side of everything, right? And the doctor goes, yeah. And he goes, and I'm going to tell you the spiritual. And God says it. You can't take my leg because he's not through with me yet. He goes, I've got things I need to do and I've got people I need to see and I've got songs that need to be sung. And you can't take my leg. The Lord told him, he said, I will sustain you. I will get you through. Don't worry. Don't think. Don't let them tell you what's going to happen. I've got a really awesome thing that I start, and I'm going to have to flip through it. It says, it's in green, because all the, all the pre- preachers had special colors. <laughs> he says, don't let Satan push or shove you out of the will of God. Dave was letting the, the doctors push or shove him out of the will of God. Had he had somebody chop his leg off, he wouldn't be able to go to Ireland and speak to 70 unruly kids who he was told he would only get 10 minutes with because they were so naughty. And then he was in there and he sang some songs and they were doing anything and he had a cowboy hat on. And apparently they really like cowboys. And he takes his hat and he goes, anybody want to try this on? And they were all quiet and they rose their hand. He used what was in his hand to minister to these kids. And it turns out like every kid in this auditorium tried on this hat. And he got to sing his songs. God wasn't through with him yet. Don't let people, don't let other people's ideas of what you need to do push or shove you out of the will of God. And if you don't know what that is, then I'd say get in the word. Spend some time with God and say, you know, I don't know what's supposed to happen with me? Am I supposed to go to school? Am I supposed to just be a mom? Am I supposed to be a teacher? What, what am I supposed to do? And you all have the visions in your heart of, you know, things when you were younger. And if they haven't came to pass, I imagine that they're from God. What can you do to get to that point? Don't let what people say push or shove you out of the way. Because it happens all too often. Because I can tell you right now, I've done it for a long, long time. One itty-bitty thought, and I'm going to let them sustain me? No, I can't do that. God will sustain me. And if he puts something in my heart, then I have the power. I have his power in me to get where I need to go. And he will sustain me like he did on Mead Avenue when I did the budget every week. And it didn't work. But everything was paid for. Mm -hmm. Because I put my trust in him. And him alone, and that's all I needed to do. And that's all we need to do now is put our trust in him. And sometimes you just have to close the columnar pack, put the eraser away, because everything will be okay. 